Hello, my name is Greg Massey, and this is the world premiere episode of The Color of Air, a podcast about the musical journey. As I'm sitting here recording this, this is probably the hundredth time I've recorded the intro to this very first podcast. And the reason is that every time I record it, I find something wrong with it. Something wrong with um, saying um too much, as I just did, saying and too much, or, uh, you know, just getting used to the sound of my own voice, which I'm not used to hearing recorded like this. But anyway, some of you may be aware of me from my previous musical bands, such as Maldon Lowell or K.O. Dot, or my current musical project, Balaset. Or some of you might just be stumbling onto this by some other means. And in either case, I want to welcome you and I want to thank you. Um, support like that means a lot to me to get this thing up and running this has been a project that's been in the works for a couple of years now you know I've, I've i'm a huge fan of podcasts myself but i don't listen to very many music interview podcasts or i'm not aware of a lot of them i listen mostly to comedy podcasts or um, music podcasts where they play a lot of music and which don't feature you know in-depth interviews and then um, a few months ago, my old bandmate Toby Driver introduced me to Jeremiah Simerman's podcast, the 5049 podcast, which is amazing, and I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to hear really cool in-depth interviews with interesting musicians. And that kind of gave me the final push I needed because I really like what Jeremiah is doing, and it also... You know, I, I sensed a great camaraderie with him with what he was trying to accomplish with what I want to accomplish. And a lot of it is just, you know, I like stories. I like hearing musicians' stories. I like hearing any artist's story, for that matter. Filmmakers, what have you. My, some of my favorite DVDs are the classic album series. And since about 2006, you know, I had this kind of breakdown not a mental breakdown, but more of a, I had quit my band at the time, which was KO Dot, and uh, myself and my drummer, Adam, from Balaset were starting to get back into trying to finish our first album and get things going with that band. And I felt this kind of great, not emptiness, but if I have to put it in a kind of almost Zen Buddhist way, I felt completely like nothing. I felt at that point that, that, you know, I was, I guess, not self-destructed, but it kind of brought me down to a place where I realized that I felt like I didn't know anything. I'd been playing music for many years, and I truly felt like I didn't know anything. And that was kind of a weird and humbling place to be. But it was necessary because it started kind of phase two of my musical journey, which is the pretentious tagline, which I invented for my pretentiously titled podcast. And and along the way, I've you know developed a lot more as a musician or as a songwriter, but also as a music listener. Um, and it got me more interested in learning more about musicians. And I've been pretty blessed with a lot of different musicians to enter my life. So I wanted to use this as an opportunity to talk with them because as I discovered, there's a lot I didn't know about them. So these first few episodes are going to feature a bunch of people who I've been blessed to share the stage with. And I'm hoping that you find their stories as interesting as I do. So that's it for this introduction. Nice, quick five-minute introduction, as opposed to the twenty-minute one that I did a couple days ago. And sure, there's some microphone pops that are happening in this one. This is a low-produced podcast. This is just me in my bedroom, talking on a microphone and walking around, which is probably a faux pas in the radio world. But it's what I'm doing because it's what's bringing out the inspiration in me to talk to you people. So, first interview. First interview is going to have a little bit of 
audio craziness with me because I'm getting used to recording software and microphones. In fact, the first few episodes are going to have a few audio flaws, but oh well, that's just what happens when you start something from scratch with the basic tools that I have at my disposal. Before I get to the interview, though, let's give a few plugs. First of all, you can email us at colorofairpodcast at gmail.com. There will be a website for this podcast soon, but I don't have it set up yet. Secondly, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash colorofairpodcast. Or you can follow on Twitter at the color of air. So now on to the guest. My very first guest is a British guitar player named Matt Stevens. Matt Stevens is a guy who I first came into contact with on the internet um, around 2009. I forget how, but I started following his musical career and listening to his self-released albums at the time. He was doing a lot of solo guitar and loop pedal kind of stuff, which for me, I've seen a lot of droney uh, musician types or college jam band people who use the loop pedal and create very, very boring music. But Matt doesn't. Matt creates pretty cool soundscapes, and it kind of stems from a unique sense of melody, um, a love for chords, and a love for creating dense chords, or not your traditional chords, I guess, and a love for odd time signatures. And as I'm talking to you right now, on Friday, June 27th, I just found out that Matt's been nominated as a breakthrough artist at the Prague Awards. Thanks in part, I'm sure, to the profile he's raised for himself over these last five years, starting with his solo project, then moving on to the band that he's in called The Fierce and the Dead, all leading up to his most recent album, Lucid, which came out this year on Esoteric Recordings. He's a brilliant guy and really personable, and just as an example of how good of a dude he is, back when I was trying to promote my band, I emailed him asking for suggestions on music review sites or podcasts to send my music to, and thinking he'd maybe just send me a couple links or something like that, he sent me his entire Excel spreadsheet of contacts and websites. And I just, that really endeared him to me, because that's something that not a lot of, maybe not not a lot of people will do, but it was just, for someone he barely knew, I don't even think he had heard my music, for all he knew, I was just some crappy indie music artist which some people I think think I am still. But he sent me that, and it was really cool of him. And when I first started the podcast, I decided he had to be on it. He's brilliant, and I really like talking to him. So there you have it. Uh, But before that, one other plug I forgot. RetconRecordings.com Retcon Recordings is the independent label that I have created to release my music. So go to retconrecordings.com and you can stream or buy the Balaset releases, our debut album, A Time for Rust, and our new EP, Exordium. So please consider listening and buying. Uh, the money goes to a couple good causes. A, it goes to the band to help us continue to make excellent independent music. And two, um, two dollars from every sale of our EP Exordium goes to a therapeutic writing organization started by my mother called Mains and Motions, which is also a very, very good cause. So please consider checking that out, listening and buying. Enough with the plugs. Let me play you a song by Matt and his band, The Fierce and the Dead, to get us started. This is called Part Four. And it comes off of their second album, Spooky Action, which came out last year. And in addition, throughout the podcast, I'll throw in a couple tracks from Matt's solo album called Lucid. 
and feel free to look at the show notes to know the names of the songs. So thank you for listening and enjoy the song and enjoy my interview with Matt Stevens. Hi, Matt. How are you doing this morning? Not bad. Sorry about that. I was um, so the other side of the room. I think for some reason my sometimes my iPhone picks up my um, Skype signal before my um, computer does, so it can be a bit of a nightmare. How are you? I'm doing great. Doing great. Just uh, just waking up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry it's so early. So I've got I've got to go. Um, so after I'm, I'm supporting. Do you know IQ? Yes, yeah, I do. Supporting them tonight, and so it's all a bit. I've got to go down. I've got to meet him with the guys. There's a, the Celebrate Festival in. Um, where are, what is it? End of May, and then I've got to meet him with the guys who are running that to sort out the promotional stuff for that. See what they're doing for it because um, it's a massive sort of festival. Celebrate. Um, it's sort of, uh, about Froster headlining it, and um, who else is playing? Um, Anathema and people like. There's still quite a few sort of bands in that. Oh. And, um, we're, we're we're playing it. I think they want to do some, work work out a plan basically to promote it a bit more. So I've got to go down and help them with that for a bit. So that's the that's sort of the next thing to do this afternoon. So it's it's, it's quite exciting, but it bloody has a lot going on. Yeah, <laughs> it sounds you know, like, it, it sounds like it. Well, I mean, I've been 
looking at your, uh, you know, I mean, I follow you on Twitter, and like, yeah, it seems like you're busier than ever. He's got, he's, well, I mean, I think the, the way it's sort of gone is it was like years of um, sort of gradually building that, building up, and it's, so this album sort of come out, and it seems to have been a bit sort of like, here we go. Um, there seems to be people here, you know what I mean? There seems to be, there seems to have been a little bit of a sort of turning point, so we, which is really nice. Oh, yeah. But, um, but yeah, when it all sort of happens, and I, I do, um, I work with, well, I've got, work, I work with people with autism and learning difficulties as well, so that's my other sort of thing, and that's kind of one of my, sort of actually, I pay the bills most of the time as well, so I'm trying to do that, and do the music stuff as well, and it all gets a bit sort of, um, bit sort of incredibly busy, really, so I'm very lucky, I'm very lucky to be able to do it, but blimey, it's become, um, become very uh, intense and I've got a two year old as well. So he's sort of running around as well. And uh, it's, it's really, it's great, but it's really intense. How's the podcast going? You sort of, is this the, is this the, what's the plan for that? Oh, uh, so, well, basically what it was is that like, you know, based on my uh, experience with my prior bands, I found like, I felt like I had like a lot of good musician contacts in the world. Right, man. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, I listen to a lot of podcasts myself and not very many music podcasts, like not very many where there's musicians talking to other musicians. Right. And and it just it just seemed like a no brainer. And uh, it just took me a while. It's a plan I've had for about a year and a half now. Um, and then this year, I really just kind of focused my effort and said, we're going to do this. And so uh you're the you're the you're the test though. You're the first oh, one. Yeah. You're, you're, you're the you're the first <laughs> interview. Uh, so oh, that's lovely. How, how's your music going at the minute? Uh, it's going well. I mean, um, you know, we're in the middle of recording an album, uh, like off and on. So we're uh, trying to finish up the vocal recording and the bass recording or the bass writing. And so I'm pretty much I do two rehearsals a week with the band now one with the vocalist one with the bassist and um so it's all just tra- you know i'm trying to get gigs and trying to you know do what you do but you know like you you know yeah i've got a day job so i mean i've got limited time which i can use to everybody has at the minute as far as can work out you know anathema frost well a lot of those got everyone has to do i mean it's like uh, everyone I, I can sort of speak to, they've all got either a day job or something else they earn a living from. I don't know anybody who's certainly not on the I mean, like knife world. They're teachers and painter and decorators and stuff. And you know, everybody's you know, Carvis is in Gong now, and he still does painter and decorate work as well. It's just you know, there's I'm not sure where the level is where you hit where you suddenly yeah. don't have to have a day job anymore. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's just like, you know, it's one minute they're on you're on a big stage playing to hundreds of people, the next minute you're painting and decorating or working, you know, doing everybody I, I know, nobody's um, I, apart from the guys in Stephen Wilson's band. I think the guitarist in Stephen Wilson's band's a teacher as well, but he's mostly there. Uh, the guys in Big B Train all work. Um, you know, they're all. It always seems to be that um, even if you're selling like Big B Train, sell like ten thousand copies of their record. They do really well at that sort of that sort of scene. They're a great band, but they, they all have to have day jobs as well. It's crazy. Oh, yeah, isn't it? yeah. It, it's. I mean, I remember with my old band, we had a record contract uh, with a small indie label. But it was funny. Like they said, you know, in order for you as a band to make, I think it was like three thousand dollars you know like in in revenue or yeah, royalty yeah. you had to sell we had to sell ten thousand copies of the album and i'm just like okay so we barely <laughs> we barely sell a thousand yeah and it, we have to ten times that and then you have three thousand dollars which you have to then split between six people <laughs> i'm yeah. like okay so <laughs> that's the gist of it basically yeah i mean yeah. I, I don't know most i mean like um Probably one of the most. I mean, the, the Tangent sell a lot of records, and um, my friend Andy's the keyboard player in the bank of the Tangent, and that they, they, I mean, they're they're really good in that. And it's like, but uh, and in in like Russia, they'll go out and play festival, the headline Ros Fest. You know, they were mm-hmm. quite in prog circles, and he he has to work as a teacher as well. It's just, you know, there's no, there's no one I sort of know. Um, 
I mean, a lot of the guys, they're sort of session musicians or or, te- or mu- music teachers. Music teachers and is, a, is a popular one, really. Mm-hmm. I suppose because they're all really good. A lot of them are really good musicians and really good players and that. But or, or they do stuff like I do. I do sort of music with people with autism and learning difficulties, which I, which I absolutely, you know, I really enjoy that on a good day. It's a fantastic job. Um, but a lot of them, everyone's sort of got something else they have to do, really, to, to try and keep it all going. So... And it's that edge between, you know, so if you're selling, you know, like, like you say, 10,000 records, it's like you do start to earn, if you can get to 20,000 when all the costs are recouped, you can probably do all right. But to get to that point, I mean, you're talking, you know, in prog land, that's, that's your dream theatre level, you know yeah, I mean? Exactly. That's, your, that's, that's big. That's really big. You know, if you can sell 10,000, I mean, a hit in prog is three to 5,000 copies of an album. Yeah. That's a massive record. Yeah. <laughs> and then, like, if you can get to 10,000, I mean, you know, that's huge. But how, even if you can get to that point, you're still not making enough money to be able to earn a living from it. And to get to the next level, you'd have to tour massively. So you'd have to do, like, you know, like five, six months a year on the road. And to get, you know the t- the tipping point to get from ten thousand to twenty thousand is probably huge in terms of the amount of touring you'd have to do and the amount of work, and how many people you know most of the guys I know in prog bands and then everyone's in their sort of thirties or mm-hmm. sort of tw- um, a lot of them have got you know the the point they're starting to get commitments in their life so they can't you know it's like they can't really go out and do that level of touring really because it's such a massive risk to try and get from one level to the other it's it's very difficult. I mean, you know, even um, even like like I said, a lot of the well-known bands, a lot you know, there's only so far you can go before you hit a sort of a wall, really, and mm-hmm. you'd have to say, and I, I don't know where that wall is. I don't know. I don't. I don't know because I've not got there yet. Because <laughs> every record I've done seems to have done better than the previous ones, which is fantastic. But I don't really know where how to do it, to be honest. Yeah. Well, I'm oh, sorry. What was that? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, I think this is just a, a strange time to be a musician. Yeah, totally. And, and especially to be an in, you know uh, independent musician or, or a small musician. And yeah. no one really knows what to do. <laughs> and, well, no, and... Exactly. There's no one's got an answer because, <laughs> I mean, to, to uh, the thing is, if you want to sell, um, to engage with the press, you have to have a label, really for the press to take you seriously if you want to get a decent amount of press mm. um, and to sell a decent amount of records you have to have a label but if you've got a label you can't sell enough you can't make enough money to be able to you know what I mean it's it's yeah <laughs> what you do it seems to be really yeah, I mean like the work the label they've put out my last album um, East Terry have been fantastic they've been really good and they're lovely people I can't say enough nice things about them but you know, there's only so far they can push you, you know what I mean? Because they haven't got the money to reinvest in things either. So there's just, I think in the 70s and 80s, there was the money floating around to make it all happen, but it's just not there anymore, really, is it? Mm-mm. No. You know? No. Yeah. You can't complain, though, because at least people are hearing it, and we're having this conversation through this magical internet thing. Yeah. So <laughs> it's not complain, eh? You know no. what I mean? <laughs> well, um, what I was going to do, too... Um, I kind of so I was up kind of late last night writing up notes because I had I felt like I had a gazillion things I wanted to ask you because it's kind of you know just you know because like I said I you know you're someone I've been aware of for a long time uh, probably I think since I started putting out my music in 2009 with I you know I I don't even remember I to be to be honest I can't remember how I started following you on Twitter <laughs> I it it, it but I just remember it's like for some reason Matt Stevens has always been there. <laughs> I, I think it was, it was maybe just from a maybe a podcast I listened to or uh, or or something or somebody recommended me. But you know you're you've kind of just been this presence, <laughs> just just uh, ruining Twitter since. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't. No, I would never say ruining. Because, <laughs> but but I got to be honest. You know, uh, I mean, I don't know a ton about your previous stuff like, like what you did like, so if you don't mind me asking you know what what is your background I, I, did you have any kind of previous bands that you played with beforehand um well, i lived in a place in called northampton in northamptonshire called rosedon right and mm-hmm. there was nothing to do there it was a very sort of small place not a lot going now full of lovely people it was a nice place to live in that but um basically um it was a very hard place to get anything going musically um 
but I just sort of did stuff with my friends. And then we moved down to London about 2001. Mm-hmm. And I was in sort of rock bands uh, that would always sort of be sort of punky sort of bands or indie rock sort of bands. But I'd be trying to do stuff with unusual chord sequences and uh, odd timings and a lot of the stuff that really um, that comes from my interest in the Mount Vision Orchestra and King Crimson and things like that. But also I love bands like the Smiths and the Dead Kennedys and Carcass and Death Metal and Indie Rock and Husker Do and things like that. I love all that sort of thing. But also, you know, King Crimson and the Mount Vision Orchestra are massive for me. You know what I mean? Miles Davis and, all, you know, all that sort of thing. So I'd always be bringing those sort of things in. And if anything, those sort of things were probably making the bands I was in less and less, you know, fit for purpose as indie rock bands. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was just sort of ruining bands, really, with these funny chords. <laughs> so I did that for a long time. I spoiled a lot of bands for a long time. And then about 2005, I um, the last band I was in split up. And one, the other guys went off their separate ways and did other stuff. And one of them, they all went in different directions. And basically, I was left with the acoustic guitar and the loop pedal. And I thought, well, I'll just go out and do the open mic circuit for a bit of a laugh. Um, I'll record a few tracks and see where it goes. Because I still wanted to do music. And I thought, well, I'll just do what I want now. It's because I'm not going to worry about singing. And I'm going to do things in really crazy timings. And I'm going to use lots of inversions and lots of weird chords. And I don't care. And I'm just going to do what I like. And probably no one's going to be interested in it. And and it doesn't matter because it's just going to be doing what I want to do. And then all of a sudden, I started putting the stuff on the internet. And all of a sudden, people were interested in it because I didn't realize there was a you know, King Crimson fan community and, and people like that. I didn't realize there was Twitter. I didn't realize this, you know, and it grew with Facebook and, and Twitter sort of came back. And then um, variously, I mean, there was people talk about prog revival, but there is an element of a prog revival. I think that people were more accepting of funny time and stuff, thanks to bands like the um, Mars Volta and things like that. So, and there's the sort of the underground scene with like prog archives and things like that. And there's that sort of underground proggy sort of thing and like progression magazine and all this, there's always that sort of underground thing with like the um, classic rock society in the UK and various sort of, you know, acid dragon and things like that. But I didn't know any of that existed. I was just making records, making little tapes and putting it on my space and just seeing what happened. Eventually, that sort of scene found my stuff because it was, you know, people were comparing it to Robert Fripp and McLaughlin and, and the stuff, you know, the stuff that's obviously an influence on me. Um, and it became sort of adopted by that scene really. Um, so it was never, there was never a great, let's start, let's, let's go into, into the prog scene. I, I mean, I didn't know anything about the British prog scene until about 2009, 2010 when I started playing the Peel and they'd be better. I'd find bands like Credo and Tiny Fish. Or the Tiny Fish are absolutely brilliant band, uh, friends of mine. Um, and you know, I, I became friends with these guys and just gradually got to know them really um, through um, reading about the Peel and you know that they, they sort of found me really. Um, but I was doing quite a lot of stuff on MySpace and Twitter and Facebook, and I was doing streaming online gigs as well. Where I'd just set up. Um, uh, a camera at home and, and stream from my from my house and do things like that and I was doing a lot of open mic circuits and then I gradually went from the open mics to supporting people like John Gom you know the acoustic guitarist and mm-hmm. doing stuff with people like um, R.M. Hubbard and Thomas Lee and things like that but concurrently to that I was playing like open for Fish and back with James Harvest and um, like a lot of the sort of um so next wave of British prog bands. So I ended up, I've done stuff like Colin Edwin and um, Sanguine Hum and people like that and mm-hmm. all those sort of bands. And then I'd also do stuff with sort of a lot of the sort of post rocky sort of bands. And then sort of the Knife World sort of scene, which sort of the post cardiac scene, which is, you know, Knife World and Guapo and people like that and, you know, and Thumper Monkey and all those sort of guys. And I gradually sort of became friends with everybody, but there was no real grand plan. It was almost like when once the prog guys sort of found me, I thought, well, this is fantastic. And then I learned about people like the Tangent. And I mean, I'd seen Porcupine Tree in the 90s, but I didn't realize the, por- the Porcupine Tree was still such a, would become a sort of flourish into this big band. Yeah. And I didn't realize because I've been, you know, well, I lived in Northamptonshire. There wasn't like anybody toured there. Mm-hmm. And until I got onto the internet in 2006, 2007, I had no, I had no knowledge 
of any real prog revival of them. One of the first things I did, I looked at um, the King Crimson website because obviously I'm a big fan. And I read Fripp's diaries and I met and I got to know Sid Smith somehow. I don't know who runs King Crimson's website. And people like that. And I gradually sort of it gradually sort of got to know a lot of people. Yeah. And then I remember Prog magazine coming out. And I thought, this is really weird. There's this magazine about this music that, you know, perhaps it isn't just me and a few because I thought the only people who, who remembered and knew King Crimson and the Malvision Orchestra was me mm-hmm. and my mates in my back yeah. bedroom at home. I thought no one else was interested. I thought, and we got into it because our guitar teacher was into like Bruford, you know, the Bruford solo albums, mm-hmm. King Crimson, the Mavishnu, um, that kind of thing, and the Groundhogs, bizarrely, and, which all real, real big influences on me, like Holdsworth and that. And um, <laughs> so I didn't know anyone else liked this stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I know it sounds incredibly naive now because you can Google King Crimson and there'll be thousands of posts come up and there'll be, you know, all this stuff. But at the time, in the you know the early nineties, everyone was listening to Pearl Jam. It was just like you know, you know was, that people would you'd play people my vision orchestra and it'd be like, well, there's no singing. This sound, people would just say it sounds horrible. But we loved it. We thought right. so, my vision orchestra were like, you know, out of the stuff we liked at the time was like Dead Kennedys and Sonic Youth and things like that, which is fantastic. And I could see no difference between Sonic Youth and King Crimson and the my vision orchestra because it was all really interesting, funny chord. Um, progressive, exciting rock music, and I didn't think there was any real difference between any of it. And it was only later on when, and it, like I say, and I was into really into like Celtic Frost and people like sort of death, like sort of thrash metal with experimental thrash metal stuff. And it, it only really dawned on me later that this stuff was um, there was a cult following for it, and it was p- specifically called progressive rock. Mm-hmm. And I, I always thought prog was more you sort of yes and things like that. And Genesis and the sort of and and, and Rick Wakeman solo stuff and, and that kind of thing, and I always I don't know I always sort of thought Mervis Norkish and King Crimson were perhaps something else, but I, who knows? This is for journalists to decide, not for musicians. But um, yeah, so all this, all this, just all it was just all this stuff, and it was there was never a grand plan. But when Prog Magazine came out and all this, it started to become a lot more. You know, I think a lot of dots got joined up, and there seemed to be a bit more of a scene for it. But um, no, there was never a, a grand plan, but yeah, it's a, you know, it's great what, the way it's happened, really. Yeah, it's it's well, it seems like it's been very natural and organic, and yeah, and it's it's actually interesting because it brings up another point that um, uh, this is uh, something you know I found very interesting, and um, I actually brought up when I would discuss things with people about you know, how do indie musicians make money? <laughs> yeah. And I, and I remember this is a, I'm probably quoting it wrong, but the, I always bring up something. I remember you wrote on Twitter where you mentioned something along the lines of, uh, that the modern, you know, your modern independent musician, the goal is not selling a lot of records, but developing a fan base of a small group of dedicated people who will buy everything that you do. We've got and, a chance then, yeah. I mean, I always look at, like, Marillion. They were always the ones. Yeah, it, it, and I remember thinking, like, at the time, being like, that makes so much sense. <laughs> because, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it, it was, because it was, at, you know, this is like 2010, 2011. You know, this is when, you know, because you, you saw it too. I mean, uh, Radiohead did their thing, mm. and then everybody... And I think you were the only person I knew, or the only kind of person where you were actually making that whole um, pay what you want for your music. It, it seemed to actually work for you, whereas the rest of us were like, yeah, pay what you want. And then everyone was just like, okay, zero. <laughs> well, I think, the thing, so, I mean, the thing with pay what you want, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily do things pay what you want now. Because the pay what you want price was contextual. I think at the time it was interesting and remarkable. I think uh, that's and and later on it was less so. Right, I can agree. I, no, I can see that because I've I've noticed that you don't do it as much now. No. Yeah, but um, but at the time, did you feel like it it really helped you get at least a footing, like you know, a a, a footing in the in the the scene basically be, you know because yeah i mean my, my problem at the time was obscurity and i didn't have any money either so <laughs> it, these two key factors made me realize that there was not going to be a big marketing spend 
So <laughs> I, I made my first album for 300 quid when I was working part-time in the shop. I was working, no, I was working a full-time in the shop. And um, I made my first album for 300 quid, which to me seemed an outrageous extravagance, <laughs> spending that 300 quid on making the first album. And... Um, so, but but by doing everything very cheaply and getting friends to help me and stuff, I hadn't spent a lot of money. So I wasn't going to lose a lot by giving away the first album. So my first idea was to try and um, get people to hear it. And I knew that if I could get an email list that had, say, um, sort of three thousand people on it, right, mm-hmm. and then and I and I could perhaps uh, perhaps ten to twenty percent of them might buy it. Uh, but that's a business model so if you can find 300 people who will guarantee to well not guarantee because nothing's guaranteed in life but they will most likely buy an album three to five hundred people that's a business you can then put you know you can sit there and go well you know there's going to be a little bit of cash flow coming in here so that was the start of it already so to try and sell sort of three to five hundred and then it gradually grew from there but yeah the, the reason i did it um, the pay what you want thing it was like I say there was just no marketing budget at all so I had to work out a way to get in the music to people and to remove every single barrier for people to discover it I and mean, if that was just I mean, if one of those barriers was a financial barrier well let's get rid of this barrier and get them to buy it I get them to have at least have a, a copy of it to listen to um, at the time that was fairly unusual but the, one of the problems with what's been happened in the last five years is pay what you want it's become a standard um and it's no longer remarkable, and people just go, "Well, it's pay what you want. I don't have to pay for it." Mm-hmm. Um, and what I learned that if you want people to actually pay for stuff, they have to have some sort of either real or imagined relationship with you. I.e., they have to think there's an element of uh, connection there, and whether that's a real connection or not um, depends on you know the individual. But most of the time, I, I would always make the effort to if someone spoke to me on Twitter or spoke to me on Facebook or emailed me, I'd always email them back and try and um, because I was, to be honest, very grateful for their support. I wasn't that one of these people who just thought, oh, brilliant, there's someone else. I was over the blooming moon that someone was interested, to be honest. I was so happy, you know, after years and years of doing stuff until I was 29 when I started doing solo stuff. Um, and I, I was at that point of, well, yeah, I'm 30 next year, you know what I mean? That's me done. Um, which I'm very young. To, I mean, yeah, ridiculous, no. <laughs> ridiculous, you know what you like. But, um, but at the time, it, was, it, was, it seemed like a big deal to me. Um, and I, I never really in, so I just thought, you know, I've got nothing to lose. So it was just like that thing of, right, give the music away. I'll make the records I want to make. I think it's, you know, 2006 or something like that. And just put the record, you know, put the records out and do what you like, basically. Yeah. Mm. And I think removing all the barriers of discovery was really important to me. Um, and I think with an art, if any musician starting out now or trying to build an audience, I think the key is to initially give us, give away some music build the relationship, try and collect, you know, a thousand to three thousand email addresses and try and get as much, you know, build do podcasts and, and build relationships with people and make friends with people and stuff. And then when you get to the point of you have a small sort of audience, then you can, you know, you can approach record companies and promoters and say, well, look, um, I've got the you can you can download what I did when I've approached, you know, labels and stuff before, I've just got you know, could because there is a certain level you can hit independently, but in terms of like getting press and stuff and getting onto the bigger tours, you know, doing the opening slots, the credibility of having a label is massive mm-hmm. because, in, you know, you can't, like with magazines and radio and stuff, there's, there's a lot of the time you'll, you, you can build relationships with the magazines and the press and the, and the radio yourself, but that takes years. But if you, you're on a label, you will make less money, but the relationship, you, you'll be able to have access to relationships these guys have built up over 10, 20 years. And you'll never have, you never be able to build that yourself and maintain them at the level you're at and maintain the, your relationships with the audience, relationships with uh, promoters. The job's simply too big. And because um, of the nature of what, what I do, um, there's not enough money floating around for me to be able to do it full time. So, you know, I do need another income. Um, my fr- I mean, one of the people who does make a living completely full time from music is my friend John Gom, who's a, who's a fantastic guitar player and a lovely man. And what he did, he just gigged and gigged and gigged and gigged and gigged. He just did loads of gigs. And eventually what happened was he had a hit video on YouTube 
and it and it had four million viewers and it was a massive thing right this video it was, it was brilliant this guy's a phenomenal guitar player a lovely man um but that kind of tipped him over to the next level of success but people didn't see the nine years of going around sleeping right. in the car and working your ass off for those years and it's such a big thing to get to that point and i think the the, the key is the faster you can get to the point of having a supportive audience the actual chance of you being able to do it and do it um and do bigger gigs and ma- make something approaching a living from it becomes more realistic no I, no i agree i mean um i mean yeah and just what you were saying about um well yeah i mean they see the video they don't see the nine years it took for him <laughs> to get for him to get there <laughs> yeah but it's like you know oh here's the next you know cool video and you know yeah. i mean how many cool vi- i mean you know on facebook how many cool videos do people share with you every day you know whether it be a band or you know uh somebody making a fool of themselves in public you know it's like <laughs> it's it's a strange it's a strange medium <laughs> and... Wait, exactly it's like um uh, and also a lot of those videos you know videos get they get the volume of them that get shared so say you've got four million people who watch your video. That's not four million people who are going to buy your album. Nope. There might be four thousand or four hundred that will buy your album, but the sheer volume of videos um, that gets that get um, shared and get um, spread across the world, um, uh, it, it's it's terrifying. I mean, it's because that you know you can have a hit video, it doesn't convert into a career or into any 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 real momentum at all. It happens all the time. They get these sort of quirky videos and it, uh, and you get a spike on your website and and you'll, you'll have a few hits but it, ne- it won't convert into how, I mean, how many times do you see an interesting video of a musician and then go and buy the album that's quite a big step yeah it's like perhaps giving away a track for free in exchange for an email address you might do that and anything to it's, it's like the goal isn't the the fans you really want are the guys who buy steve because my friend um do you know a company called burning shed Yes, I do. Yeah, friend, friend of my, they, they, I know the guys who run it. They're really nice, brilliant people, and their sort of business model is based around sort of selling these sort of top end box sets. So they do like um, and and specialist items to very niche fans, right? So they're the guys who will seek out the Stephen Wilson box set, and those are the guys you know this. You know when Stephen Wilson's album comes out, there's a special edition box set. And yeah, they do all that. Those fans are the ones you don't have to spend much on marketing to reach because they're so keen and the ones who will buy the high ticket items. Yeah. And they're the ones you need to get on board. And that's the, you know, the art of it is, is to, to build the audience with those people. However, you can't ever compromise your art, to, but to, to please an audience, the music has to become first. It's all about the integrity and the honesty of what you do, because you you won't pick up those fans by trying to create a bespoke, nonsense progressive rock album that no one wants to hear because i think you could there are people who who cynically will aim things at that audience i think that's that's completely redundant um uh i i think it has to be all about this with the prog things a lot of people are craftsmen a lot of people and a very few artists Mm -hmm. so you get a lot of people are very good at pro tools very good at playing certain parts of the guitar very good at creating stuff that that sounds well that's really well done really well done but sometimes you lose the element of the art in there you lose the you know the guy um yeah and, and these guys who are very good at social media and very good at selling the, you know the whole package yeah but there's the guy who's crying into his four track trying to desperately make this desperate you sid barrett you you know you you're great interesting artists you Robert Wyatt's, you, those sort of people, sometimes they're being left behind at the moment because the industry has become very entrepreneurial and very um, doing your own thing and making and making things stuff happen and less about the, um, you know, the, the, the individual artist. And that's, that's, mm-hmm. that's it's a bit of a weird change because I think, th- I think the industry's changed a lot, whether it's for the better or not. I don't think we're at a point we're going to know, to be honest, because... Um, at the moment, the, the music industry is still there. There's, there's still, um, you know, the labels do still have all the relationships um, with with the press and 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 like I say, um, it's um, it's not about um, 
it's it's not it's that that industry is still there. It's not gone yet. Mm-hmm. When it's gone and it's just the fans and the fans, things will be different. But I don't. What, what, the way I see it progressing is perhaps in five, ten years' time is a lot more bands self-releasing and a lot fewer people buying them. But they probably make about the same amount of money, you know. But um, you know, there might be you might put an album out and if it sells a hundred thousand, you've done really well. But you're not spending the money on the you know the marketing of it so much. Right. I think that's probably the way it's going. I don't know. I mean, I, I really don't know. And but. Perhaps that is the way it's going to be. I don't know, but we'll see. And I'm very happy at the, how, how things are at the moment, but we'll have to see how it goes, really. I don't know. Hmm. Oh, well. No, I, no, that's interesting. I mean, it's kind of interesting when you talk about the prog scene, too, and you're talking about you know the burning shed model and the, the people who will buy the high-ticket items. Because you know my experience with the prog scene is is i don't know how different it is from the british scene because it seems to me like the british scene is it's rejuvenated there's there's a younger crowd going into it would you would you agree with that not necessarily in the british prog scene to be oh honest. okay i wasn't sure because um, I, was, I think in the, in the metal scene sorry i don't need to um oh no it's okay um so in terms of the metal scene um I think a lot of the the newer fans coming in is from two different directions, right? It's from the post rock. There's a few post rockers who have crossed over into Stephen Wilson, mm-hmm. and there's a few metal kids who've sort of come in via Dream Theater and Anathema and um, some of the sort of prog metal sort of things. Yep. So I think you've had some metal people come across, but whether there's any many young younger prog fans, I'm not really seeing them at the gigs, to be honest. Um, although the Fierce and the Dead, the band I play, we do a lot of post rocky sort of gigs, where the audience is probably 15 to 20 years younger. So that's a lot of people in their 20s and 30s, rather than their 40s and 50s, which is the average prog gig in the UK. So say if it's Anathema or Stephen Wilson, Stephen Wilson does attract a slightly younger audience, actually, to be fair, because most of his audience, uh, you get a lot of the prog sort of metally sort of crossover sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and a little bit younger, but someone say like a life science show or something like that, or um, I don't know who else, um, Frost or something like that. A lot of the audience tends to be in the forties and fifties. And I'm not saying that's a particularly bad thing. I'm just saying that's the reality of the situation. Um, and uh, you perhaps you know there's the less of the 60s and 70 year old guys who are into Yes and Rick Waitman and that sort of thing a lot of the audience currently in the UK prog scene came in with Marillion in the early 80s yeah, that, yeah so that's, the, that's what I was thinking yeah. it's the, the Neo guys um, so so when I'm supporting IQ tonight I would imagine I would look out to the promoter just emailed me and told me there's going to be 700 people there, which is slightly nerve wracking. I'll be honest, when you've, you've only got an acoustic guitar behind you and you haven't got a full band. I'll, I'll have to do a bit more rehearsal this afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but when you look at that audience, I would imagine that would be guys in their 40s and 50s. Now, um, like I say, that's not a bad thing in any way at all. It's just a different thing. And... Um, how many people that would be um how many people it's like that audience is probably getting a little bit older now and how long everyone's going to keep going to gigs in this country i don't know but I, I've, my argument you know yeah how long is it going to be for these guys in their 50s stop going because i know the guys in the 60s and 70s are stopping going yeah i've just been on tour with um gordon giltrap who was a lovely man and his his audience are in their 60s and 70s and they're starting to thin out a little bit. There's less of the people coming to the shows. So this becomes a bit of a problem, to be honest, because if we can't get you know younger fans interested in um, interested in their music, and I'm over the moon that guys in the 50s and 60s come to the, see what the gigs that lovely people, they know a lot about music, very wise and intelligent fan base, but those guys aren't going to be around forever. Right. And, you know, I'm... I'm you know, I'd, I'd like to still be gigging when I'm, when I'm, when I'm 50 and 60, you know yeah. what I mean? So, um, and it's, that's not going to happen at the moment. If, unless we can get cross over to an younger audience. And like I say, Fierce and Dead has that sort of post rocky sort of slightly younger audience, which is good, but they don't really come to the, there's no real crossover between those guys and the, 
you know, perhaps the cardiac audience is a little bit younger. There's a little bit of a younger sort of guys in the thirties and forties, um, but they're still not, you know, young guys coming out to gigs. No, I, no, okay. I was glad to hear that. Be or not glad, I should say. But <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> Sorry, the coffee is still working, so <laughs> I'm coming up with the wrong word association. But because well, I was going to compare it to you know my experience in in the states, you know, just it seems to me from the it's the same thing. You know, I remember going playing a prog festival with my old band, and yeah, the median age was probably fifty, and that was two thousand two. Mm. And you know, uh, you know, and and you know, how many of these people are still going to be around in 10 years, 20 years um, to go to shows or, or to have the ability to go to shows. And I mean, it's nice because I I think, you know, that's a good target audience for kind of the higher end stuff, because I, it's, I don't know if it's the same in, in, in England, but for us, from what I can tell, these are people who uh, have a lot of, you know, prog fans are very intelligent <laughs> and, uh, and then, um, and then also a lot of them are very successful in their career, so they have a lot of disposable income. So, so you know, so it's 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 fine to be, you know, and they will buy, you know, high end mm. vinyl releases or box yeah. sets because you know they probably have a beautiful sound system at home because yeah. they love music so much and they can afford to have the best. Totally. You know, so yeah, it, but I agree, it's kind of interesting that if you're not infusing a, a younger audience, then, you know, 10 years, 20 years down the road, you know, what will, you, you know, we're, I guess we're probably just looking for a new Marillion then to kind of bring the, <laughs> it, it needs, well, because one of the problems you've got at the moment, is look at near fest, near fest went, didn't it? And it's, cause I've learned so much about this last five years. That's so much about progressive rock. It's uh, unbelievable. But, um, near fest, it, it really, the only game way to get a British, prog band over to america is to play a festival right mm-hmm. so really rosfest the only game in town um unless you go out and support you know stephen wilson or you know it's one of the big bands which is very hard to do so really rosfest is the only one the one to get on you know what i mean yeah because um, there used to be near fest well near fest has stopped and and once rosfest is gone well that's it really isn't it and yeah um the ros fest audience is, is is the same as from what i understand i don't really know a lot about it because i've not been and i'd love to play there but it seems to be the older audience again and it's um unless we can cross the bands over so like i say it needs it needs exactly like someone like marillion who um were a new progressive rock band uh, so they got a bit of yes's audience but also you had a lot of the guys from the new wave of british heavy metal come across to them so there was that sort right. of crossover of younger guys coming into it well that's not really happened again because a lot of the porcupine tree audience was either the metal guys who'd come across with opeth and people like that which is fantastic or um it, it, it's, it's still sort of a, a older audience really for, for Stephen wilson i mean i sort of um uh when I was at the Royal, I went to the Royal Albert Hall, Stephen Wilson show, and it was definitely still an older audience. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I like those guys. They're, yeah. they're, they're, they're nice people and they buy a lot of records and, you know, you can't complain having an audience. I'm just saying in, in the, in the problem is where, where's that going to be in, in 10, 20 years time. And it's, um, it's something that I think a lot of the, the prog bands, my friends in prog bands are all acutely aware of that. Um, what happens when those guys go and it's, 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 there's no new audience comes through and where will we be then? Well, the answer is we won't be, we won't be, there won't be anything, you know, yeah. it's the end of it. Um, so it's, it has to be, it has to cross over to a younger audience. Otherwise it will go. Mm-hmm. So I think that's the, 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 the job of, um, people like i mean probably I mean, I'm, I'm i'm in my 30s so i'm probably too old i don't know but i mean probably have someone younger to come through and and sort of bring younger guys on board and hopefully it'll start to kick up i mean there's bands like sid arthur do you know them no no i don't think they're, i've ever heard of them they're sort of british pro band and there's there's like haken do you know haken no i've never actually heard of them haken either. they're really good they're um like a prog prog method they're a bit like dream theater but they're really really good and there's a said i mean they're starting to sort of bring some people in so we'll have to see really um but like i say this this the neo sort of movement 
is kind of the tail end of that is is what's sort of is still quite big in the UK at the minute. And like I say, some really good bands in there. The fans are great. You know, it's it's not a negative thing. It's just it's just a bit of a change in the guard, really. I oh suppose. man. Oh yeah, no, I definitely find that the you know uh, yeah that audience. I mean, it's 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 it's. I wish that bands could could have an audience like that, a in fiercely loyal yeah, it's fan amazing. base. You know, and, and that's the thing. Like, they, it's such a a wonderful scene in terms of if you if they like you, then you've got a fan for life. You know, and and I don't know if if other scenes have that kind of loyalty. You know, from what I've seen, you know. Um, well, I mean, from what from what, the way I understand it, I mean. Um, uh, that that they, there was this thing that came through called the, the one thousand true fans. Which the, basically, the theory was if you could have a thousand true fans that bought everything you did, you could have a living out of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, my my problem with that is you need a vast amount of ambient fans to be able to sell a thousand things to everybody. So, by what I mean by ambient fans is you might need a hundred thousand fans that know about you and vaguely like you and possibly like your Facebook page, but they're not going to buy everything. You know what I mean? You probably need a um, hundred thousand of those to sell a, a hundred, sorry, a thousand um, fifty quid box sets. You know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. just the nature of it is is so. And to reach the point of having a hundred thousand fans would cost so much in marketing. Um, whether you'd actually get to that point is, you know, it's 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 a very expensive business to acquire new fans. Which is why I did all the giving away music for free because I wanted to cut down all those barriers and build up my email list. Yeah, but the actual thing of acquiring new fans and making new friends with you know what I mean that's a massive deal. Mm-hmm. And it's a really hard thing to do. So um, it's um, it's 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 a very hard thing to do. And to get that younger audience, and I mean I've 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 been quite lucky through Twitter and Facebook and through. Um, sort of doing quite a few sort of non-prog gigs. So I've done like um, played with like a lot of post-rocky sort of people and sort of R.M. Hubbard and John Garm and sort of the acoustic guitar people. I've got a little bit of a following that's not necessarily prog. So that I've got a bit of a crossover thing going, which is quite uh, I'm quite pleased about. That's that's a good thing. Um, but it's, it's a very much a um, um, it's a change. It, Things are really changing at the moment, and I think anybody who knows, who thinks they know what's going to be happening in the music industry or um, or the progressive rock or the way things go, I think things have changed so much in the last fifteen years. Um, it's very hard to call, and I think you'd, you'd be, you know, it's. I think possibly we're moving to a time when streaming will be the accepted way of listening to music, mm-hmm. which just you know that's a, a massive problem for um for people like me but who who basically you know um, a lot of the income i had was through download so once we move to streaming it's like well you know what do we do <laughs> yeah spotify is a good service for fans it works really well i've got it in my phone it's brilliant but it's a terrible service for musicians yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah yeah i agree <laughs> as a fan it's fantastic because I, I love listening to new music you know i can have a day where i'm gonna i'm only gonna listen to disney soundtracks from the 60s and 70s brilliant i'm not gonna go and buy them right I to listen to them and spotify fills that need for me someone who's interested in music you know and um it, it's 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 a great discovery tool, and that's what I'm into is discovering new, interesting music. And whether it's it's John Barry or Aphex Twin or Carcass or you know other things I like, it's Spotify is a fantastic tool for that. Mm-hmm. Or ELO or Napalm Death, you know, or, or anything that I'm, I like, um, or the Mavish Orchestra. But um, as a as a musician, it's a nightmare. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like okay, so you're gonna make zero point zero 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 one cent for this? <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and that's and if you've only got, I mean, for the thing, the thing that's fine if you've got a pop hit that's well listened to. But if you're a cult artist like every prog band is, even Stephen Wilson, that's a problem. Yeah, because you're only going to get you know a few thousand people playing it, or a hundred thousand people playing. That's not a business model anymore. No. And 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 you, um, I mean, 
you become so reliant on touring. So many, so many people are touring at the moment. Everybody's, you know, um, you know, um, everybody's a touring, you know, is um, making the money off gigs. And but they say that you know, oh, you can make make the money back off gigs. But if you try gigging as a prog band, it's so expensive. <laughs> you know, what I mean? and it's like I mean, I've got loads of gigs coming up at the next for the next um, few months, right? I've got so many gigs. Um, I think I must have. With probably the band and so like probably really twenty five gigs across the UK, yeah, and not one of them will turn a profit. You know, I'll lose money on some of them, and I'll probably make some money. But once I add it all up, I would imagine, um, you know, by the time we get to the end of it, I will make no money at all. Yeah. And I'm not moaning about that because I choose to do it, and it's a wonderful experience playing live, and I love it. And that's you know, but it's not a business. It's not a right. business. Is is selling. You know, selling CDs and selling downloads. So that's 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 a way of making some money from it. And um, but but gigging. I mean, you know, if you're if you're gigging and, you, and you, you're driving halfway across the country to play to 30, 40 people, well, that's that's, ne- that's never going to be a you know. I mean, we headlined a, f- a, fe- a festival and it was really busy, but uh, we still came out about we couldn't afford a hotel room to stay in, so we had to drive you know four hours home at one in the morning. <laughs> Because you know, and we and we were one of the main acts on it, and there was people there. Um, and one of the interesting things that was a post rock festival, right, with the Fierce and the Dead, and it was oh, close to sold out. It's probably a couple of hundred people. It's only a small thing, but it was a line of ten pounds on, and it went down really well. Um, but we, but at post rock events where the audience is younger, you don't sell CDs. You yeah. don't CDs don't sell like, but whereas you'll play a prog event and it feels perhaps like you haven't gone down quite so well, you might sell 10, 20 CDs. So it's a really interesting sort of business model that um, it's very, very different. You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Um, now, before I, I, I go on, I, I will say, I mean, I know you're a busy guy, so I don't want to keep you too, too long. Oh, no um, worries. Um, it, 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 um, and thank you very much for doing this, Greg. Really oh, pretty- oh, no problem. I mean, it, I mean, the whole goal of this uh, mm-hmm. is is to a, exp- like I said, I want to find people who musicians who I personally find interesting, who are doing interesting things. And while uh, that whole last chunk of the conversation was based on what I thought was, uh, uh, or what I pr- what I found to be very interesting um, ideas you've had over the years on the the business end of it. I did want to kind of go into the music a little bit more, if that's okay, because I don't. I want well, people to know how brilliant of a musician you are, too.
Well, because I was going to say, because, you know, my main research for this is, I mean, this past week has been um, really paying attention, listening to Lucid and listening to the last Fierce and the Dead record. Oh, thanks, man. And I think both of those records are so good. And and I, I like how they're they're very different in certain certain respects, um, obviously, because, you know, one's your solo, one's the band. And my first question is just, you know, when you decided to do the Fierce and the Dead, um, and that's kind of you moving from your acoustic looping style to a full band electric style. Yeah. I mean, how was, I mean, was that transition easy or, you know, was it, was it very natural? Because I mean, I think the, uh, you, you, the collaborators on that were people you were working on, on your solo records anyway, correct? Yeah. I mean, those guys are people I've known since they're from Northamptonshire again. So I've known those guys since I was 14, 15. So I've been playing with them for years off and on in various sort of bands that I, you know, over the years and sort of jam, we'd, we'd get together and we'd do sort of punky sort of bands or sort of jam and do really long tunes and, you know, that sort of, sort of um, drinking and playing the guitar. They're just good mates, you know what I mean? And um, and the people, I, I'm a massive fan of, the, especially the Stuart, the drummer, is my, is my favourite drummer of all time. I love his drumming because he sort of combines uh, really interesting, powerful, you know, quite um, complicated drum parts but really with a lot of passion and a lot of aggression and he's a really wonderful player and um steve and steve and kev produced my solo stuff and he was like the best man of my wedding and he's like you know since we were kids so he played he was the bass player and then uh, we brought steve in he was um another mate from from northamptonshire so um Playing with those guys, it was very much a case of we did a jam for um, one of my solo records and it just started to sound like a band and so we just carried on doing it really. Um, also, I mean, I really enjoy playing with them and it's very much not my band, the first and then it's very much a collaboration. And, you know, I might bring in a lot of the ideas for the for the parts, but the other guys will develop them within the context of the band and I might bring something in that's completely different by the time it comes out. So, um, and, and, and Kev, um, well, normally happens, I'll bring an idea in, the guys will develop it. And then once we developed it and recorded it, Kev will mess around with stuff and change it and add parts and, you know, post-production wise. So, you know, it's a, it's quite a complex process, but, um, it's, it's a really useful collaboration for me because I learned so much from it and it's just a really good laugh and I really enjoy playing with those guys. So uh, in terms of the differences, really the difference is it's through the filter of those other players. And it's it's really uh, playing with those guys and then coming out their own parts or they're even writing, you know, a lot of the, some of the tunes I don't, I've, I've not written either. They're, they're written by the guys in the band. So um, it's very much, it's, it's a great, they're a great bunch of guys to play with and it's, it's a really, really, um, it takes the pressure off me as a solo person really. And it's just something I really enjoy doing. And, uh, well, I also have to say, too, I mean, um, in listening to uh, Spooky Action, uh, the the last record, I mean, I have to uh, say that the, the, the album cover, I've never seen an album cover more accurately kind <laughs> of describe what the music you're about to hear is. And I know that sounds strange, but it, it, it uh, to me at least, I was just like, okay, you've got this very colorful scheme and you've got a Thunderbird bass, and I said, "Okay, I think I have a feeling of what this is going to be like." Because I don't, I don't know about you, but you know, there's just something about uh, about that imagery. I was like, "Okay, so I'm going to get something a little powerful, but with a lot of different <laughs> all over the place." Yeah, yeah. and um, <laughs> oh, it was brilliant. I, I think it's a great album, and you, you know, that, that that's amazing, and. Uh, I mean, and I knew it was more of a collaboration effort, not so much um, like your solo yeah, records. Totally, man. Yeah. I mean, thank you, thank you very much for that. It's very kind of you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's fine. Um, but the thing I was also interested in is, you know, by doing the Fierce and the Dead, you know, because it seems like you've brought the kind of full band mentality to some of your solo stuff on, yeah. on Lucid. Was it was that because? you had gotten used to, to kind of playing with the band um, or, or recording with the band, I should rather say. And did that just kind of make your solo stuff transition to more of a band stuff as opposed to you with just an acoustic guitar? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think a lot of it was, I mean, I've made, the first album was just an acoustic guitar record. The second one's an acoustic guitar with electronics, a little bit of drums and a little bit of other stuff. The third album, Relic's got a few more full band tracks. And this one, and it's got, the, had the violins on it on, on Relic as well. The, my friend Chrissy played violin. Um, and then this one, it was a case of, I knew a lot more people, to be honest. Yeah. So I could sort of... Um, it wasn't like let's bring down my celebrity mates, but it was it was a bit sort of like well, you know, if you want to get somebody to play a keyboard solo that's a bit Jan Hammery, you can ask jo- you know you can ask Jim Godfrey from Frost because Jim Godfrey from Frost is one of the best keyboard players in that style I've ever heard. So it'd be ridiculous not to ask him when he's your mate. You know, what I mean, it's just you know, it's 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 the obvious thing to do. And 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 um, Lorenzo who played bass. And one song was a mate who I've become friends with over the year. Um, uh, and he was working with Pat from King Crimson, who played on a track from it. And he happened to be in the studio with him and played it to Pat, and Pat really liked it and did it. So, I mean, it's just these ridiculous sort of things um, where all the people who played on it, there was no, they're right, they were just mates. And Charlie plays bass in Knife World, came on board and bass. Because I didn't want Kev to play on it because uh, and everything on it because he's the fifth of Dead Space player, so it becomes it would become very fierce and a deadly. So I didn't want to do that. Stuart's like I say, my favorite my favorite drummer, and he's on a lot of the tracks on it. He's just brilliant, and so much of it is um, you know um, having that thing of just trying out new sounds really, and I just every record you do, I mean. I, has to be different you have to right. i believe that musically to to keep you know to make if you make records i mean i've been very lucky they've, they've all been pretty well received apart from the traditional prog people who can't stand me but um <laughs> i don't care to be honest. <laughs> um, it's it's but i think you know if you're not annoying them you're doing it wrong um, <laughs> but, um, you know your, your traditional you know i think i've been very well lucky the record's been very well received critically and by the audience so i think you know the last thing you want to do is pander to anybody and and try and do the same thing as you've done before and i think you know the reason possibly people like the other ones because i didn't care what people thought i just made the records i wanted to make and i think you have to be um really brave in what you do and just think this is what 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 do i want to do here don't think about the press. Don't think about the audience. Think about where you want to go. Don't think about the record label. Don't think of any of that stuff. You just got to think. Well, what's inspiring and makes is it, you know interesting for, for me, and, and and that's where the record came from. Really, stuff that's, that's exciting for me because um, I'm not financially driven for the music because I've, you know this this the last thing. If you try and do weird music, try and make a living out of it, you, you're mad. Yeah. So you have to sort of do it because you love it and and for me to follow through with the stuff and, and make it all happen well i had to I had to do this really and um and make the record i wanted to make and i'm, I'm really because I, was, I think i was listening to jay Z and so frost a lot before this and also i had been through a bit of a bad patch where i got really miserable for a while and you know sometimes that sort of makes better records yeah i know <laughs> i know it's really cliched but you know we you to go through a bit of a bad patch so that inspired like and the the, the, t- the track the bridge on lucid's about um uh it's all about it's a really heavy riffs and it's supposed to soundtrack it's an alternative soundtrack to the film it's a wonderful life um so this you know the, the bit of the end of it, if you've seen it, it's a wonderful life but the end of it then it's about realizing that what you've got is possibly what you always needed. And you're in, you're, you're in the point of your life because you've made the decision for a reason. And I realized that, um, you know, whilst through my music, I was never going to be rich and famous or anything like that. But, but it was, and I sort of thought, well, that was never your goal because the people that I love musically were complete failures. I mean, mm-hmm. big star, Sally Frost, um, King Crimson, these these guys were, were you know they were making weird records that no one really bought and Cardiacs or whatever. And I think the key to it is I just wanted to make the records that were interesting, and exciting to me, and not try and do things that have been done before. And when your heroes are financial and um, you know failures musically, yeah. don't ever think you are going to make records that are going to make loads of money. But 
you've got to just do it because you love it. And I think that vision sort of hopefully will shine through that people will be able to hear that you're doing it because, you know, there's a clear line of thought bet between your inspiration and what you're actually delivering. It's something that's real and, and not fake and not trying to please people or be what, you know, this is the fashionable sound to have, or this is the, the what people want to hear. Or this is, you know, this is the, the, the latest sounds and presets on just none of that, just doing doing what you want, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And you know, the you know, the way you're talking about it too, it, it kind of leads me to my next thing, um, which is um so just a quick background. So you know, the name of this podcast is going to be uh the color of air. That's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, yes, I got it from a porcupine tree song, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> but the idea is, uh, you know, I wanted to talk to musicians, not, you know, about all sorts of things, but one thing I, I won't, I, you know, I, I'm fascinated with is, is tone and, and, you know, the, the gear you use to yeah, achieve, yeah, yeah. achieve these things. And I found in listening to spooky action and in listening to lucid, you're bringing a very interesting you know, guitar tone to the, you know, you're, you're, you're going for something a little, you know, a little grittier, you know, like I hear like a lot more fuzz pedals as opposed to, you know, just, you know, your standard overdrive and, yeah. and things like that. And was, you know, is that just, is that kind of like your, uh, uh I'm trying to think of the right word. <laughs> is that just, you know, you know, was that something conscious where you just wanted to try and come up with something a more interesting guitar sound for yourself well i think a lot of it as well i mean um i, I don't necessarily listen to a lot of um contemporary prog so i mean those influences aren't really there for me um or the st i use um electro harmonics uh, metal muff which is kind of the edge between a, f a distortion and a fuzz so it's kind of like a big muff, but it's more defined. So you've got what I want out of a first pedal is um, something that oh, I can play dominant seventh chords and elevenths and quite big chords, but still have the you know the, the individual notes shine through. Yes. One of the best pedals I ever had for that was an original Shredmaster, and then the Marshall Shredmasters, um, which I don't uh, I used to have years ago that broke. Um, but I could, if I had another Shredmaster, that's what I'd really like. Um, Both sort of that sort of. It's that right at the edge of, you know, a lot of, I can't use a lot of contemporary amps, a lot of um, marshals and messes. It's really hard to get that sort of, what you want is really fuzzy, distorted, exciting guitar sounds, sort of, but you want to be able to hear the chords as well, which is really hard to do. Because, I mean, I'm not really into just playing power chords. I'm, it's all inversions, it's all 11s, it's all 9s, you know. It's all over the place. And, um sometimes it's very hard to get those chords to shine through when you've got lots of um, distortion. So I, I tend to go for more of a fuzzy sort of sound, but perhaps um, not quite as distorted as press. Um, so, and also on the records, what I'll do is I'll have one guitar that's really distorted, the one guitar that's less distorted. So it doubles up and you can hear the, the sort of um, the, the chords underneath as well. Mm -hmm. and live, I'll just use the, 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 um, the metal muff and then just dial it down slightly and then I've got a boost for lead as well because um, it's like a it's a, like a dual channel metal muff thing that's really useful. Um, and that's that's my real core distortion sound. I, although on the album we had a Mesa triple, I want to say quadruple. Red, one of the, one of the rectifiers. <laughs> it was. I'm not a big fan of Mesa amps. So I think they just sound so generic normally. But this was absolutely really good amp. And what we did, I think we used the clean sound on it. And then overdrive, used the overdrive for my pedals, I think. But anyway, it sounded really, really good. I think we had, we had a matchless amp as well. Matchless are really good. Um, and just these, these these amps are just in the studio we recorded it, and they just happened to have these amps there. Um, but yeah, a lot of the time, it, yeah, it's definitely more towards the fuzz sort of sounds rather than the um, the um, the um, the full sort of. I mean, I, I'm not into those sort of generic flat marshy sort of sounds, right? Um, and I think it's really important to have your own guitar sound. Uh, there's a band called Jay Z, um, and they're, they're some of their guitar sounds I absolutely love it. My Bloody Valentine, I really like as well. Their sort of guitar sounds, so it's sort of a, mm. 
um, a combination of different things and, and Celtic Frost guitar sound and, and, and Greg Ging from um, Black Flag as well those sort of really distorted but hopefully so you can hear the chords as well and that's a really and like the clean sound in the face of Derek was totally based on um, Dead Kennedy's guitar sound with that, um, with that delay sound it's just that's totally where it's from and it's <laughs> well, so many of these influences come into it and it's, you sort of think but I was listening back to some of the the Dead Kennedy uh, Face of the Dead stuff, and I thought it sounds really Floydy because it's um, a, a Telecaster with the delay into a valve amp. And so, well, it's not just Dead Kennedy, there's a real Floyd sort of thing there, you know, a real sort of um, early sort of um, Amagama sort of era Floyd thing in there as well, which is you don't realize until you go back. It's like, well, I love Amagama, you know, I mean, I love that sort of era of Floyd. So, there's so many different things in there and so many different influences um, that. Um, it's not. It wasn't ever a case of let's listen to different stuff to be clever. It's just we just. I think me and my mates were just into like oh, it's Reading Carcass, King Crimson, Floyd, everything. You know what I mean? We like just love music, and um, we didn't. I think because we came from a place where there was no record shops and there was no outside influences, we were so isolated. We didn't really realise it was unusual to be into psychedelic rock and death metal and all this stuff, and we're just into the same stuff, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we were so isolated from reality in the early 90s, we didn't realise, to be honest. (laughs) Well, yeah, the way you're just talking about it it reminds me of the way I grew up, too, because, yeah, I grew up in in Connecticut, which is one one of the most boring of the United States of America. Um, sounds very exciting to me I really... yeah. <laughs> um, you know but there really wasn't much of a music scene and yeah. you know and, and like you said it was the 90s I mean I can remember you know the band I really got into in high school was uh, was Iron Maiden oh I and, love Maiden and, yeah and you know and you think okay Iron Maiden one of the biggest metal bands in the world but in 1993 94 when I was getting into them it was kind of like okay no one really knows who I'm talking about and <laughs> And and I really felt like I was the only Iron Maiden fan in the entire universe at that point, even though I know that's not the case. <laughs> no, but, I mean, but, they, they're my first favorite band, Maiden. I loved them. Oh. But yeah, I, I know that feeling. It's just you know, you you feel like like you were saying about you know uh, when you were discovering Mahavishnu and um, King Crimson. It's like no one else knows this. Yeah. It's it's it's, it, and so I think that makes a very you know kind of um, personal connection to the music because you feel like you're their only fan. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. Totally. I mean, I, um, I, I, but yeah, Maiden was, I mean, I, I got into Maiden 88, 89, seventh, uh, no, seventh Sun era. Oh, my favorite and, um, album. <laughs> yeah, it's phenomenal, isn't it? That was the sort of last, sort of, I mean, I, I like a lot of stuff they did, but those sort of up to seventh Sun was the, just, I thought they were, the, you know, they're such a great band and I still, I've seen them recently. I'm, I, the, when they come on, I start crying, I, Every time I can't watch them without welling up, it just makes it's just amazing. They came when I saw, I saw them do um, what was the tour, the early years tour, mm-hmm. the Hammersmith Odeon, and they um, they had um, uh, they came on, and the intro was Eyes of March off mm-hmm. uh, Killers. So Dale, 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 yeah. Dale, and I was just welling. I was. Cry my eyes out! Oh, like, so I'm, good. I'm jealous they, now. I'm jealous they, now. <laughs> they went to Rathchild. Oh, I was just like, this is, you know, this is this is what I, the gig I wanted to see when I was 14. You know, yeah. it, it was phenomenal, and um, it just makes you realise that um, you know, music's so powerful. And, and like I say, if you're in the same situation. When you're isolated like that, music becomes a real friend to you as well. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, um, it, it was my only friend. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. Yeah, I mean, a lot of us. I mean, bands like Maiden and, and and you know, I was I was a massive geek. I was into right. My interests were comics, um, like Alan Moore, weird comic stuff. I was into um, thrash metal. You know what I mean? It's like you know, and I made and, and all that stuff, and you know, and, and even in the darkest of times, I mean, I was, I was when I was about ten or eleven, I was into role playing games. So, you know, the chances of me ever being cool were very little. <laughs> but you know, but my mates were all into the same stuff, and when we were kids, that was you know all the stuff we really liked. So, yeah. and and I think 
you know, when you're trying to, I think you do, in very much in the early 90s, music sort of defined you in a funny sort of way. But whereas, you know, perhaps to kids now, social media defines them. And finding a magical band like Maiden, who make this fantastic music and seem to live in their own strange world mm-hmm. with Eddie and you remember I remember I used to listen to Maiden albums and I used to read the inlays to every single yep. reference yep. You, know, you know what I mean all those thanks lists and stuff I can you know, used to read the in, look at the covers and see all the you know the covers somewhere in time oh I was just about to bring that up oh, I, said, <laughs> I can't I can't tell you how many times we used to draw the um you know the the Derek Riggs logo. Uh, Did you ever look for that? You know the yeah, circle. Yeah, yeah, the... No, exactly. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> I I even did, uh, you know part of me wants to get a tattoo of that, even though oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I know exactly what you mean, and I always thought when uh, he stopped doing the album covers, that was the it really changed the and the later yeah. albums were never as good as the classic Riggs ones. I never thought. You know, those later ones are any anywhere near as good as the, the the early ones, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, I do. I mean there was there was a select few songs from each thing. I mean, the closest one for me and, and this is kind of an interesting experience. I think I'm the one of the few who has this. Uh, but I was on tour in two thousand and six, um or sorry, two thousand five maybe. Whenever that uh, a matter of life and death came out. Yeah, yeah. And at the time I didn't have an iPod, all I had was a disc man and, you know, uh I had a backpack, so I really couldn't bring a whole lot of CDs with me, and that was I had just gotten it, and so I spent a lot of lonely, you know, nights on the road listening to it. And I remember that record to me stood up as okay, this is the album that should have come after Seven Son of a Seven Son. Yeah, th- those 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 Maybe. last few they've done are a lot better, aren't they? Those, yeah, I mean, so, Final, Final Frontier. Like, uh, yeah, <laughs> but uh, yeah. but a matter of life and death was something where I was like, okay, this is where Iron Maiden is really hitting on yeah on the that, cylinders. That, uh, the one after that's pretty good as well. The one, um, I can't remember what it's called. Was it the last, what was the one after that? Final Frontier. Final Frontier, yeah. There's, mo- there's moments on there's, there's moments on those, the run of 2000s albums, particularly um, Wicker Man. Oh, which, yeah. It's real sort of power slave here in Maiden again. I, I, when I see them live, they did Wicker Man and stuff, and they were really good. Yeah. I'm not a massive fan of Yannick Gare's guitar playing. To oh, my God. Thank you. <laughs> right. What well, I saw them live, and they had Adrian Smith, right, who I consider one of the greatest melodic metal guitarists of all time. Yes, right? yes. Bill Steer and Mike Hammett and guys like that. And, he, and, Bill, and uh, Adrian Smith was there, and yet they were letting Yannick Gare do this terrible lead solo. And I was just like, the guy who wrote the lead solo is there. Yeah. He's yeah. there. Just oh. let him play the fucking this, solo. I can't, can I tell you that you're, have, you're, you're saying the exact same things <laughs> that I thought in my head. As soon as I heard, uh, they said, okay, as soon as I started playing, inf- uh, not Infinite Dreams, um, uh, Evil That Men Do. Yeah, and they do "Evil That Men Do," which is one of my favorite Maiden oh, songs. And it's such a and again, Adrian Smith is one of my top yeah. influences. And yeah, he's phenomenal. Yeah. And that solo he does is so brilliant. And then I'm like, wait a minute, he's not. Wait a minute, why yeah. are you not playing? <laughs> wait a minute, what's, what's that guy do? <laughs> uh, t- to be fair though, I, I just to as a, as an aside, uh, uh, so you know when I was in high school, obviously Maiden was as popular as they were or have re-become, and so it was during the Blaze Bailey era, and they they came around to a small club in, in Boston, uh, which was a couple hours from where I was, and so I, I went up to go see it, and, uh, and you know, we're, you know, we're talking, like, maybe, like, like, 200 people, 300 people at the, at the gig, maybe, maybe a few more than that, but it was a small gig for Iron Maiden, and, uh, very personal, and, and I was walking around, and, you know, of all the members of Iron Maiden who I could meet, Yana Gers. Really? <laughs> and I was just like, and, it, 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 this, and the thing was, he was the nicest, most, you know, coolest guy. He, he was he was very given, you know, he was, you know, like he didn't mind that I bothered him walking along the street, you know. And, and I was like, I feel really terrible for all the <laughs> crappy things I've said about your guitar playing. <laughs> Because you're the, one of the coolest people I've ever met, and yet oh, here I am being like, "Oh, I hate it." Why did they get him in the band? <laughs> and so, no, I mean, that's it. I mean, I suppose uh, that's probably why he's still in the band because he's, he's he, I've never heard anybody say a bad word about him. Apparently, he's a lovely man. Yeah, so it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, it's fine. Let him just stand there, but don't have him playing the guitar. Yeah. <laughs> 
let him play rhythm guitar, but don't play any solos. Yeah, yeah. His rhythm playing's fine, just don't let him play any solos. <laughs> They're just Jesus Christ, you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh, I, I mean, I, I, and like I can say, I've, every time you see him in an interview, every time you, he seems like he's a lovely man, but his playing is just is so wrong for Maiden because he's, yeah. you know, Maiden was always about those really well crafted, perfect lead breaks. Yep, and he was complete opposite of that. He just improvising, sort of playing like Richie Blackmore sort of style. Yeah, so it's a really weird sort of. I don't really get what he's doing with those those lead. I mean, he's he's really good on stage. He's really good jumping around and that and throwing the guitar and it's really exciting to see but i want to hear adrian smith play the solo from the record perfect yes, exactly like, like he did on you know live after death and made in england that's what i want to hear yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly yeah um <laughs> i mean when um maiden played um uh the last london gig i went and um my friend carver who plays in knife world went and he he got backstage and he spoke to adrian and he said he's a really nice guy so he's really sound so that's that's nice to me <laughs> well i did just have a couple more questions for yeah, you but um, that's okay i you know yeah uh thank, thank, say thanks again i really appreciate it oh sure you? no thank you i you know i've i've been looking forward to this uh as soon as you said yes <laughs> Oh, that was great. Um, but I, one thing I wanted to touch on, and this is something I noticed, and, and I think you, you've kind of alluded to it through some of your other some of the other stuff you've been talking about. But I find that one thing I found interesting about you um, as a guitar player um, and, and as a songwriter um, is, like you said, you do use a lot of interesting chords. And to me, you know, chordal stuff is is um is is my favorite thing you know like it, it's what i do in my own playing uh and um it's something that i, I and so i think i feel like you do that really well and especially you know on your acoustic stuff or doing the looping stuff it, it gave you the opportunity to kind of build really dense h harmony and chordal stuff um and then over the top of all that i find that your melodic style is 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 completely unique you know what I mean? Um, you know, I find that, um, you know, I find that the way that you, the way you phrase melodies, it just sounds so completely left of what I would, not, not what I would do. I mean, obviously, but because uh, I, you know, not playing over it, but it, but it sounds like some, you know, like you make interesting choices. Um, and, and does that kind of come from, you know, and that kind of comes from your your varied background of all the different kind of bands. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I think the phrasing wise, I mean, um, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. Um, but I mean, it's very much about um, trying to do things that are melodic. I mean, what I think about is I work out the chords for the song, then I work out appropriate substitutions. So if I'm in the key of A minor, I think about you know I might start the solo in the key of C, or you know I'll try and think of things. I'll, I'll know what's really in key and then I'll think about what's really out of key and then um but but hopefully by the point I've worked that out I've forgotten all those things and I'm coming in from the attitude I'm just going to play I'm not thinking about any theory at all so um hopefully I'm just and I don't really think about scales I'm thinking about in terms of the phrase I'm thinking about of arpeggios over the chord of it so everything I'm thinking about is chords Everything I'm thinking about is, is substitutions of. So if I'm playing in A minor, I know that E dominant seventh will be a really good sort of way to stand slightly edgier across that by playing an arpeggio of that. But I also know that if I play an F dominant arpeggio over that, I really need to hit an A minor triad over the top of it to make it sound like I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Otherwise, it just sounds like I'm drunk and I've gone to the wrong chord. Yeah. <laughs> so the further you go out, I find the further you have to go back in. Um, to make it sound like it works. And then in terms of the melodic phrase, and I always think of people like Miles Davis and, and leaving space. Um, McLaughlin's um, lead player, we left space and then played really fast and then did space. And then, like you say, Mike Hammett from Carcass and um, Adrian Smith and people like that and Randy Rhodes and that melodic phrase, and I really love that. I'm really into mm -hmm. stuff that's really melodic and um, really well phrased and sort of um, uh, and really in, really you know, like like a songwriting-based improvisation, then 
I want st- I, I, it's that it's just always that edge right between being really in key and really out key and it's it's just constantly dancing on the edge of that that's exciting so that you know where it becomes you've got all 12 notes available but you know that you can only phrase them in certain ways to make it work and that's quite an exciting thing to do um, because you're continually on the edge of it all going horribly wrong and I have in there are certain things you can't get away with so if you play you know, you stack a dominant seventh and a major seventh and a, and a tight, you know, next to each other. It sounds crap. Yeah. And it's, you can't, it, it's not like you can say, well, it's completely chromatic playing because there are still rules that, you know, there's certain things that don't really work. You know? Yeah. It's just, it's, it just sounds horrible. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of it as well is, is using different time signatures against each other. So, say if you're playing in 13 8, you've played like um, fives over the top of that and let it loop round and stack fives and threes and so 3 8 and five, you know, f- um, 5 8 and, and, and 4 4. If you're playing 4 4 over 13 8, it sounds interesting by default. But whereas, you know, if you're playing, it's because when it loops round on the 13th beat, the the first part of the phrase is going underneath, is going wrong. But you're just keeping your phrasing the same, and the and the loop underneath going in thirteen, and your phrasing stays in thir- in four. It sounds like you're doing something really clever, and it becomes this really weird sort of um, like watching a watch go around with the watch, you know, the all the different gears of the watch, and they're all slightly out, but they make a bigger, interesting melodic picture. So a lot of the phrasing is about sort of offset of various time signatures against one another, but. Hopefully it shouldn't be about any theory at all. It shouldn't be about any of the fours and the sevens and the odd timings and the dominant seven. It shouldn't be any of that. It yeah. should about just be playing. And the key to getting to the point where you can just play is you have to have all the theory rammed into your head since you were 14 and playing over <laughs> my original orchestra records by some crazed guitar teacher like I had, where it makes you listen to all that stuff and, and just be able to do it and not even think about the, the phrasing or the... It's, it's unfortunately, I, I was well. Fortunately, I had a, very, a guitar teacher who made me do it, and I was a kid, so I wanted to learn Guns N' Roses, and he made me learn Dance of Mayhem by the Marvish Orchestra. And so it's just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was, it was. I never wanted to learn that style, but I, once I did, I got really into it. I loved it, but you know, I wanted to be in Guns N' Roses, and I made, and I didn't. You know, I was, I, I'd be lying if I said I, I was wanting to be some avant-garde guitar person. Yeah. I, wanted be, I, wanted be, I wanted to be Slash. You know? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know any other guitar teachers and yeah. he, was, he was teaching. So, and, and then I got really into it and I, got, I learned to it and I, I loved it. You know what I mean? And, um, I, you know, and I think of people like the, the lead playing of people like Bob Mould. I love Bob Mould's lead playing Tuscadoo and Sugar because it's so melodic or Richard Thompson or, Mm-hmm. You know those sort of guys. When yeah, what I, don't, what I really want to avoid is that sort of just hitting a pentatonic box and whittling your fingers around because it's, yeah. it's so much of it and it's so dull and it's, yep. it's there's no need for it because you know that there's there's notes outside that that little box where you know if you listen to Neil Young on on um, the World Live album, he's he sounds like he's all over the place, but he's putting so much sort of emotion and passion to his play. He gets away with it. and same with Miles Davis stuff. He's you know, musically, it's it's all over the place, and some of it's it's not great playing, but it's so right because it's so aggressive and powerful, and you know, listen to seventies miles, and it's, there's such passion in it. It's, it kind of it gets away with it, and so much of it is the is the you know, there's so many different things like the so there's the the, the harmo- knowing all the harmonic options and, and being able to forget them, and then just play through emotion and really feeling some nights it works some nights it doesn't but sometimes you've just got to go out on that on that limb and try it you know yeah no i no <laughs> very well said i mean it's <laughs> you know it's all about the integrity of the note i mean it sounds really pretentious but the honesty and integrity of what you're doing because you're only doing it because like i say you don't want to i mean you're doing it because you love doing it and, yeah. and the integrity is all you've got i mean i know guys on the prog scene you know, some of the guys from the older legendary bands that I've opened for and done gigs with, and they, they don't want to be out gigging anymore. They want to, they don't, they've, they've, they've had enough. They don't want to be back in the back room of a pub playing to 300 people. They've, they've done that. You know what I mean? They, they just want to go home. Yeah. That's, they're just clocking in and they're doing the job. And, you know, that's, that's the only way they know how to make money. And, um, that's really hard when you get to that point, to be honest. That's where, um, that's no way to live your life. And, I have the luxury of being able to do this because I will do other things as well to be able to retain the artistic integrity, yeah. which, which sounds like, you know, um, 
I just don't have a choice because I've worked out to make commercial music in the first place. Yes. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? It's, it's, yeah. At least I get to do it and still enjoy it. And so much of all this stuff is about doing it because you love it. And if you don't, what's the point? Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, well, the last thing I w- wanted to bring up on on your style too, uh, the thing listening to Lucid, um, the track that I think really kind of. Uh, I mean, a lot of it grabbed me, but this one in particular grabbed me the most was um, the final song, A Boy. Oh, yeah, I like that one. And because now my initial thing is I was like, well, he's a father. Was uh, was that kind of inspired by your son? Yeah, totally. uh, it, 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 <laughs> I figured I didn't want to assume. but no, totally. <laughs> It was um, basically I wrote it. Just after you'd been born, um, I had a period of sort of three years of writing this record and off and on. And some of the ideas go back 15 years, some stuff I had years ago. And basically, I, I continued to, um, you know, I, I sort of I went through it and um, uh, and I had these ideas. And, and that particular song was when I was, when I was, Left the last band I was in about 2004, 2000, yeah, about 2004, just before I started doing the loop stuff. I learned a Joe Pass tunes, and that sort of you know, that sort of jazz guitar style where you like Martin Taylor and people like that, yeah, and sort of play the the bass line with one like you know, and all that sort of thing, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of that was from that, but obviously, my my chordal interest, I and mean, I love Joe Pass. But um, my interest with chords is, is always my vision orchestra. It's always that sort of inversions and, you know, I think of going from a dominant seventh in the root or the, you know, I'm obsessed with inversions and that's, you know, that's what I'm into. So the chords to that are just really quite, um, it's that sort of, it's somewhere between, I can't play Joe, like Joe Pass, it's not my, it's, it's the sort of thing you have to devote your life to, like like being, you know, like a, um, like drum and bass or things like that. It's, it's something if you want to play like Joe Pass, it's a, it's a lifetime of devotion to play jazz guitar like that. That's a really hard thing to do. Um, and but I, I picked up a bit of that and learned the bits I wanted to learn and worked out how it worked. Um, but I also I know that if you're going to go down that route, it's a massive job. Yeah. And that that track was a little bit of that sort of thing. So playing the just the melody on its own and, and I had this sort of haunting melody thing at the end. And then I had the the thing, but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it reminds me that you know, there's a point to a lot of the things, and you know, I'm lucky I am to have the the life I've got, which is you know, where I have to, I get to do the music I like, and I get to, I've got a wonderful wife and wife and son, and I've got a wonderful um, I, I get to do lots of different things that I really enjoy, and reminding me that um, there is a point to all of this, and and that um, you know to stay positive and whether you know when you when you have kids it makes you want to continue because it makes you happy and i realize how lucky i am to have him you know so yeah it's just just a song for him really wow well that is a beautiful (laughs) way to uh wrap up the record and uh you know um i mean i just want to say thank you again for for just talking with me because this has been really great oh thanks so much man i really Um, enjoyed it thank you uh and, and I've never, it's it's hard for me, well, not hard, but uh, it's, it's rare when I meet someone who has pretty much the same exact feeling on, on Iron Maiden that I do. So, <laughs> that was um, awesome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, that, so you're definitely like, uh, uh, you know, I, I feel that, you know, I, I just from listening to it, I mean, you're, and you're such a wonderful guy, and uh, it's, it's thank you. Yeah, Cheers. it's, um, so lastly, I mean, I felt like we probably should have done this right at the top, um, <laughs> in case, you know, anybody who's listening, you know, I, I don't know the attention span yet of my audience because I don't have an audience yet, but, um, <clears throat> but can you, uh, say, you know, like where can people find your stuff? Like, okay, you know, cool. link, links and such like that. Yeah. It's, um, www.mattstevensguitar.com, but, um, Lucid's in Amazon and everywhere. It's, it's iTunes. It should be available in your record shop and stuff. So it's, it's if you can if you can find a record shop, um, but it's, it's the yeah, it's everywhere though. Yeah. All right. Well, seriously, Matt, thank you for taking the time thank with me. I you. know you got uh, a, a big gig tonight. Ah, be all right. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, don't don't worry too much. What, I think what's I'm, the worst that could happen? Yeah, <laughs> if I if I wake up tomorrow and there's a tweet saying I give up, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'll know how it went. <laughs>